Hello everybody and welcome to Toy to You Curator's Corner. Back in level 3 as I record this and looking good for full release pretty soon, at least in the south here. But while we wait for our liberation, here's another bite-sized take on early Dunedin history from Toy Two's historic photograph collection. Check the details in the description if you want a copy of any of the photographs. Today I'm responding to a request from a viewer for more detail on the Bell Hill demolition and harbour reclamation that created much of central Dunedin as we know it. There's a great newspaper article from the Otago Daily Times in November 1877 that celebrates the completion of this mammoth public works project and outlines details of its history. So I'll put a link in the description. Now Bell Hill, or Church Hill as it was originally known, was the major geographical feature of central Dunedin when the pioneers arrived. But it was also a huge obstacle to the town's development, cutting the original settlement around the Toitu landing place off from the octagon and all the flat of boggy land beyond it to the north. In a previous episode, I referred to the first attempt to open up that access with the creation of the 20-foot wide cutting through the spur of Bell Hill in 1858. More ambitious plans to reduce the level of the whole hill were developed in 1862, and work soon got underway to form whole new blocks of valuable flatland for the fast-growing town along the shoreline to the south. To begin with, unemployed diggers from the goldfields were employed at five shillings a day, which was rather a miserly sum for the time when a labourer might reasonably expect to earn eight shillings a day. But times were tough for failed gold seekers in 1862, before new gold strikes on the Dunstan and in the Wakatipu reignited the rushes inland. And at one point that year, over 700 men were employed on the Bell Hill Works. But things changed dramatically in 1863. With fewer unemployed available, the provincial government turned instead to its prison population, contracting the work to the Dunedin Jail and its hard labour prison gangs. And thus began a huge 14-year project where a vast new area of flat land was developed along the waterfront, creating first Bond Street, then Crawford Street, then Cumberland Street, all of them stretching for block after block southwards, parallel with Prince's Street. This valuable new real estate is where Dunedin's great merchant houses and manufacturers established their warehouses and offices and factories that would make the city New Zealand's industrial and mercantile powerhouse through the 1860s and 1870s and beyond. But it was the pioneer era criminals, thieves and murderers, rapists and fraudsters, drunks and rowdies who made it all possible. In expiating their crimes, they sweated it out day after day on the Bell Hill Reclamation Works. There were other contractors involved, of course, skilled quarrymen, for example, who handled the blasting of explosives that was required to smash up the hard rock. But mostly it was the prison hard labour gangs, working under the eye of warders who were often tradesmen themselves and using fairly basic technology, mostly picks, shovels and wheelbarrows. We catch a glimpse of them in these photos, including this one where the governor of the Dunedin jail, James Caldwell, proudly poses on site. And in this shot from Mellowish's 1865 panorama, we can clearly see the railway dobbins that were used to cart the fill down the hill to the grid of paddocks that were filled in, one after the other, gradually creating the new blocks and extending seawards. Burton Brothers' 1874 panorama shows the progress made in that time, and this painting, by Christopher Aubrey, gives us an interesting portrayal of a prison gang at work making what would become Burlington Street in 1876, with armed warders guarding them. And when the Great Bell Hill Works came to a conclusion in 1877, it wasn't the end of Dunedin's reclamations either. In fact, the Southern Endowment Reclamation was only finished with the opening of Portsmouth Drive in 1978. But that's another story for another day.